So, is it Bible or is it Jewish tradition? Unlike Hanukkah, a non-biblical Jewish festival that Jesus enjoyed, Passover is a thoroughly biblical celebration. The Pesach traditions have changed over the centuries, but the command to honor and commemorate the Exodus has lasted ever since Pharaoh watched his firstborn son die while the Jewish children were spared from God's angel of death. Exodus 12 is the natural starting point of study, and it suggests the following principal considerations. Passover, Pesach, comes from the Hebrew verb meaning to pass over, in the sense of to spare. And this affords excellent sense. There's no need to jettison the time-honored view that God literally passed over the blood-sprinkled Israelite houses while smiting the Egyptian ones. The term is used both for the ordinance and for the sacrificial victim. So how did the sacrifice occur in the first century? Experts in Judaica and church history provide valuable context. Jewish usage in the last days of the Herodian temple is reflected in the Mishnah tractate Pesachim. The people gathered in the outer temple court in companies to slaughter the Passover victims, the Passover lambs. The priests stood in two rows. In one row, each man had a golden, and in the other, each man had a silver basin. The basin which caught the blood of the expiring victim was passed from hand to hand in continuous exchange to the end of the line, where the last priest tossed the blood in ritual manner on the altar. And all this was done to the singing of the Hallel Psalms 113 to 118. The celebrating companies were generally family units, but other common ties were possible, such as that which bound our Lord to his disciples. The sense of family has never been lost. This holiday is a time to gather with loved ones. Children, as well as the elderly, all participate in a traditional Seder. In fact, the biblical presupposition commands, When your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service, that ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of Adonai's Passover. You may wonder who participated in the time of Jesus, who joined in the Passover Seder. I turned to different historians to get answers to some of these questions because I want to provide good information for you. And what I found were some conflicting reports about participation in the three biblical pilgrimage festivals. In New Testament times, all Israelite males were expected to appear in Jerusalem three times annually. The Feast of Passover, the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. Even dispersion Jews sometimes conformed. The temporary population of the holy city of Jerusalem at Pentecost, they could swell to over three million people, according to Josephus. The number of Jewish pilgrims suggested by Josephus does seem staggering. He did report that there were three million in attendance during a very bad time in the land. It, it was a dangerous era in Jewish history, and animosity against Rome was on the rise. Concerns about revolution were in the air. How many might have attended during peaceful days when safety was less of an issue? If Josephus is right, it would have swelled to incredible numbers. There are Talmudic references suggesting that the headcount in attendance might have been as many as six million pilgrims. The rabbis proposed that there was a study done during the time of King Agrippa, perhaps a decade after Jesus, where allegedly the high priest was instructed to count the number of kidneys from the lambs that had been sacrificed on the temple's altar. There were 600,000 lambs reportedly slain during that Passover. 
you do the math. At 10 people per lamb, the ranks of pilgrims may have actually swelled to more than double that reported by Josephus. A bigger question for me is when did Passover get amputated from the body of Christ? Now, we, we know quite a bit about Passover. We, we've gone into a little of the background into what it was like when Jesus participated in His ancient Passover Seder. But I must ask why Passover was amputated from general Christian practice by the doctors of the church. Why do only a small percentage of modern churches celebrate or recognize Passover? In antiquity, it was directly connected to Easter. At that time, Passover could not be ignored. It was more mainstream. As a point of historical reference, Easter was originally celebrated in conjunction with Passover. It was known in Greek as Pasha. In fact, the King James Bible usage of the term Easter is considered an error by many. Pasha might much better be described as Passover from the Hebrew word Pesach. The timing of Easter became an even larger controversy. By the second century, Christian leaders became concerned about celebrating the resurrection on any day other than Sunday. Following the Jewish festivals and calendar, Passover was the anchor to the Easter celebration. So when the church became unyoked from Passover, it was decided that the resurrection would be honored on the first Sunday following the first full moon after the vernal equinox. Though I reject the efforts of church leaders to move God's Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day of the week, I would give them a pass for wanting to celebrate the resurrection on Sunday, the first day of the week. That was how it was described in the New Testament. Nevertheless, a legitimate problem existed. Passover always occurred on the 14th day of the Hebrew month of Nisan, when the Jews were required to sacrifice the Passover lamb. Therefore, Passover often landed on a weekday. And as the church shifted its emphasis, a serious contention arose within the early church. Those who celebrated on the 14th day became known as quarto decimens, from the Vulgate, Latin, quarta decima, meaning 14. This practice was ultimately deemed to be a heresy by the church. And that was unfortunate. I wish other alternatives had been considered. In 325 of the Common Era, an utterly anti-Semitic church decree came from the First Council of Nicaea. We would have nothing in common with that most hostile people, the Jews. We would withdraw ourselves from the evil fellowship of the Jews. It is our duty to have nothing in common with the murderers of our Lord. So a circular letter from Constantine amplified the intentional disconnect of Passover from Easter. So now allow me to offer you a quick course on non-Jewish dating or calendars 201. Non-Jewish dating is a problem for many Jews. <laughs> Non-Jewish calendars are perfectly acceptable. Picking a calendar is not as simple as walking into a bookstore during any given January and selecting a new one with photographs of cars, cats, muscle cars, or Sports Illustrated swimwear. Our modern calendars are all based on what is called the improved calendar. And the improvement is not in the digital photography or paper quality. It is a calendar improvement, adjusting for the mathematical corrections to the length of days and the resulting number of days in the calendar year. The last fix to our standardized calendar added one extra day each four years, when the 29th of February is added in the fourth year of a cycle. And as we know, it's called a leap year, such as was the case in 2020 and 2024 and so forth. This is our more accurate, modern, new, and improved version, often known as the civil calendar. 
Surprisingly, it was not accepted internationally until 1923, when Greece finally joined the Calendar Club. The current civil calendars of the United States have included this improvement since 1752. You see, it was at that time that uh, the civil calendar replaced the Gregorian calendar of 1582, originally developed by Pope Gregory XIII. The Gregorian calendar was a corrected version of the Julian calendar of Rome, developed by Julius Caesar way back in 46 BC. Now, do you find this just to be a little mind numbing? <laughs> Me too. Sorry about that, but this is important stuff. There are currently at least 40 different calendars in use around the globe. In a shrinking world with expanding populations, diverging worldviews, and a cognizant acceptance of many different world religions, which religion, which calendar, what do we follow? It depends on who you ask and what events you are marking. Now think about it. If, if you're, you know, if you're setting a doctor's appointment or texting a time to meet for coffee with a friend, your date books or cell phones, they need to be based on the same calendar system. History is long. Memories are short. Modern calendars account for seconds lost in a day and days lost in a century. Milestones are measured differently. And they get lost entirely if not connected to a time frame, a memorable event, and a people. Passover is a very old festival connected to the Jewish people in a time frame developed by rabbis who mark the beginning of their calendar from when they reckon God created the world. Therefore, the Hebrew calendar has a lot more years on it than the Gregorian calendar. For example, let's look back to the year 2022. That marked 5,782 years from the creation of the world on the Hebrew calendar. That was the year 5,782 for the Jewish people. And on the 14th day of Nisan, it fell on April 15th, tax day. You can almost see the star of the Braveheart movie crying out, Freedom! God allowed the IRS to continue viewing April 15th as tax day, not Passover. Guess which calendar takes precedence? Tax law and Jewish law are not the same thing. And if you think the Jewish calendar is confusing, take a deep breath and consider the IRS tax code, which has nearly 74,000 pages in it. When our final deliverance comes, what will become of the IRS? Who cares? The tax codes are long, tedious, and frustrating, but they are a child's nursery rhyme compared to Jewish law. One source describes potentially millions of pages of Jewish legal codes as follows. I quote, There is an enormous volume of surviving information on Jewish law, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of pages, of primary sources covering about 2,500 years. This is a very brief summary account based on mainly the first three volumes of Jewish law, history, sources, and principles. But I have to ask the question, is it legal? Obviously, the rabbinic legal codes are quite expansive. And that is why many religious Jewish teachers and rabbis spend their entire lifetime involved at their chosen yeshiva, specialized religious schools of higher learning. Just as the tax codes have loopholes for accountants to guide their clients to avoid paying excess taxes, it is my opinion that some rabbis use the plethora of rabbinic legislation to help religious Jews navigate the loopholes of Torah observance. They have become the modern arbiters of Torah. The Torah is the five books of Moses. As we know from Scripture, God gave the law to Moses. 
Rabbinic Judaism believes that God also gave Moses the oral law. It is the rabbi's oral traditions that fill most of the pages studied by rabbinic scholars. With no disrespect intended, it reminds me of my very, very, very favorite Jewish joke about the biblical basis for some of the Jewish kashrut, kosher regulations. I mean, you must know that cheeseburgers are a no-no for reasons beyond cholesterol. One verse apparently says it all. It's literally repeated three times by God to Moses. So God said, Moses, thou shalt not seethe a kid in its mother's milk. Exodus chapter 23, verse 19. And Moses pondered the command and asked God, Okay, Lord, so we should not eat milk and meat together, right? God said, Moses, thou shalt not seethe a kid in its mother's milk. Exodus chapter 34, verse 26. Moses responded after careful thought, Ah, oh, yes, Lord, we'll wait a minimum of six hours between eating meat and dairy products. The two foods won't even touch in our stomachs. God spoke to Moses again, Moses, thou shalt not seethe a kid in its mother's milk. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 21. Moses quickly stuttered a penitent reply. Oh, 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 forgive me, Lord. <sighs> now I understand we'll maintain two sets of dishes. Our meat and dairy products won't ever touch the same eating surfaces. And if accidentally a dish contaminated, having touched the wrong food, we will bury the dishes outside. God said to Moses, Moses, do whatever you want. I will ask for your forgiveness and move right along. In a sense, some of the rabbinic rules might seem to go beyond the intent of Scripture, and some may miss the entire point. The rules about why Jews may or may not eat and how kosher packages are labeled could be an example. One oddly interesting case involving Manischewitz diet thins matzahs ended up in the courts. Marketing and consumer protection issues can get sticky. The legal hearings for the bread standard took 10 years to resolve and amassed a record of 17,000 pages. Since the number of approved kosher items grew from 1,000 items in the 1970s to more than 30,000 items in the 1990s, the rabbis and those manufacturers appealing to those rabbis for kosher certification have been very, very busy. The central motivating factor behind the surge in the numbers of products certified kosher is that it is a profit-making endeavor. But the biblical basis for such certification is quite scant. One of the primary scripture references regarding kosher food preparation is found in Leviticus. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh atonement by reason of the life. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood. Something to consider. Now the manner in which an animal is slaughtered and the blood drained has become the hallmark of identifying a meat product that is certified as kosher by the rabbinic authorities. And that certification carries tremendous financial benefit to the meat packer that markets kosher food. Without the proper logo advertising the rabbi's certification, the higher prices charged for kosher meat could not be justified. Neither could the product be legally marketable to consumers requiring kosher meat. Squabbles and scandals over such certifications have been an embarrassment to some Jewish authorities. In my opinion, the biblical intent has been misinterpreted by both the rabbis and the consumers who believe an acceptable hot dog 
is determined exclusively by the logo. What was the purpose of removing the blood? Why were we not supposed to eat it? Allow me to present a portion of that same section of text in a more modern version. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given you the blood to sprinkle upon the altar as an atonement for your souls. It is the blood that makes atonement because it is the life. That is the reasoning behind my decree to the people of Israel, that neither they nor any foreigner living among them may eat blood. The blood was always intended to be our path to atonement. I'm doubtful that God's primary goal was to create a kosher food industry with rabbinic czars being elevated to the valued gatekeepers of successful kosher slaughterhouses and packing plants. I mean, it's fine for religious Jews to follow the countless myriad of kosher regulations, but kosher food preferences won't provide atonement for a single sin committed by anyone. God always intended for the blood to accomplish that atonement. And it was through the form of a sacrifice, not a good kosher hot dog. The rabbis have greatly expanded on the rules surrounding biblical adherence. And that's not always a bad thing. I mean, there are often wonderful, proper reasons for such expansions. Conservative, cautious, careful observance can be a great thing. The ancient rabbis attempted to build what they perceived to be a fence around the Torah to help Jews stay away from the dangerous edges of disobedience. They didn't want folks falling off in sin. Alternatively, some of the rules look like loopholes from the outside. For instance, have you ever heard of the Shabbos Goy? <laughs> Quick! Someone call the Shabbos Goy!